Yeah. So, Surgeon General, the nation's doctor, now you are an anesthesiologist, treat a lot of people with pain. You are also health commissioner for Indiana, right? So clearly we look at you from a public health viewpoint. Tell us how we can address this whole issue from a public health standpoint. And I would particularly like to hear from you about the younger people. We talk a lot about adolescents who are at more vulnerable risk, et cetera. What can we do? Well, Victor, thank you so much for having me here today, and thank you to everyone on the panel. I'm particularly uh, uh, excited about sitting next to the judge because I'm passionate about partnerships and particularly partnering with the law enforcement community. I don't like bios because they usually read the wrong things, but there are several things about my bio that are relevant to the discussion today. You asked about adolescence. I'm a dad. I have an 11, a 12, and a 7-year-old who I'm worried about right now in terms of being exposed to, to substances. My boys are going to parties. They're seeing different things on TV. They're, hang, they're having sleepovers. I'm, I'm very concerned about that as a parent. Again, I'm a physician anesthesiologist, and my specialty was non-opioid alternatives to pain management. And so I have a, a lot of experience there and have experienced a lot of frustration trying to both get patients to accept it, get other doctors to accept it. As an anesthesiologist, you work with surgeons, so if the surgeon says no, then you don't get to provide it because the opioids are easier, and getting folks to pay for it, quite frankly. Uh, I got my medical school, full disclosure here, paid for by Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so as much as we want to demonize the pharmaceutical industry, I might not be sitting here on this stage right now if it weren't for the pharmaceutical industry. And so th these are complex issues where we've got to figure out how we can partner with folks and not necessarily point the finger, but, but accept the blame where, where it lies. There's plenty of blame going around. But figure out how we can engage folks as partners. I was the pharmacy and therapeutics chair at our local county hospital. And we again had to decide whether or not we pay for the more expensive abuse deterrent form from a limited pie that we had to provide care to folks, or do we pay for the cheaper alternative? I'm a prep professor of anesthesia at Indiana University, and as you mentioned, Governor, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of educating our health professionals. Uh, they are not getting the education that they need and they deserve to respond to this, this epidemic. You mentioned uh, being health commissioner of Indiana. Most of the folks in this room probably are aware. I was at the helm uh, when we had to deal with the largest HIV outbreak in U.S. history related to injection drug use, and it was all due to the drug Opana. And thank you very much for inviting me to testify at the FDA so that we had an opportunity to, to shine a light on that issue. Town of 4,000 people uh, where, uh, where they'd never had more than three HIV cases in a year in the previous 10 years, now up to over 220 HIV cases in just two years related to injection drug use. So big challenges there. And then the final thing I'd mention is, uh, is that I've dealt with addiction. I have a brother right now, and some of you have heard this, I've said it in, uh, during, uh, during Senate testimony, who's in prison right now because he has untreated mental health problems, which turned into untreated substance use disorder, which turned into a prison sentence. And that scares the heck out of me because, as was mentioned, we don't know who's most at risk. I'm worried about my kids and their genetic makeup and whether they inherited something that's going to make them predisposed to being the one who becomes addicted when my son who plays soccer sprains his knee and gets prescribed an opioid. And, and again, we don't know who's going to be the one who, after that one pill, is at risk versus the ones who aren't. But you've had a lot of great talks today, and uh, the question and the frustration for all of us is where to start? It's frustrating because the problem is big. I've got a question for you all. How, how do you eat an elephant? Anyone heard that one before? <laughs> one bite at a time. And I would add one more point to that. You eat it one bite at a time, because any one of us is never going to be able to eat an elephant, uh, eat an elephant in a short amount of time. And every, every second we wait, someone's dying. But you also eat it together. Because if everyone in this room decides we're going to eat an elephant, by golly, we're going to eat that elephant. <laughs> but if one of us tries to eat it alone, it's going to be a daunting task, and we're never going to get it done. So we've got to do a better job of identifying where we and others can take a bite of that elephant. 
We've got to do a better job of it, helping folks understand where to start and where each of them can fit in, whether you're the pharmaceutical industry, whether you're doctors, whether you're patients, whether you're policymakers like the governor, whether you're the FDA commissioner or whomever, what's your bite of the elephant? And we had a lot of talk about science, so I'm not going to talk about science today. Uh, I'm going to talk about communication. The majority of problems in, in our workplace, in our life, and, and wherever we're talking about come down to communication issues. And we in the health and medical communi uh, communities are doing a very poor job of communication, an abysmal job of communication. If prevention and good health are the product we're selling, we are not doing a good job of getting folks to buy it. Overwhelming evidence there. In the medical and health communities, we can be pretty arrogant. We think we've got the research, the science, the moral high ground, and we just try to hit people over the head with it over and over and over again and expect them to, to, to finally listen to us. And you've got two policymakers up here that I hope you'll engage and ask them how that goes, particularly in Kansas, particularly in Indiana and the Midwest. Uh, we've got to do a better job of really identifying our target audience, voters, policymakers, folks in the law enforcement system who are the more common touch points than actually the medical community, identifying what motivates them and speaking to them in a, into, speaking to them in a way that engages them and enables them as partners. I'll quickly finish with, with my thoughts about where I want to take the Office of the Surgeon General in regards to the opioid epidemic. I've got three larger thematic priorities and then three more tangible areas of focus. Number one is better education, and you've heard many folks talk about that across the spectrum. Folks in the community, children, teachers, law enforcement, providers, pharmaceutical companies, policymakers. There's so much we can do on education, and I challenge each one of you to figure out how you can become better educated as an individual and which group you can do a better job of educating. Number two, better adoption of evidence-based practices. Because we know that with the right help, recovery is possible. With the right help. But we aren't doing a good enough job of, of making sure we're, we're researching, identifying, and promoting those evidence-based practices that have been proven to work. And then number three, better partnerships. My motto as Surgeon General is better partnerships um, for better health. And you brought up the point that it's odd for you to be up here. That's a problem. That is a problem. You, you said it better than I ever could have, and I'm, I frequently say this. The number one touch point for people with addiction is not a physician. So we talk about a public health approach. Well, the number one touch point isn't a public health touch point. It isn't a medical touch point. It is the law enforcement community. And church. we are not going to solve this problem unless we engage the public safety community. This room should be half full of people from the law enforcement community if we really want to tackle this issue. We've got to engage non-traditional partners. Uh, another important partner is the business community. And so my areas of focus, and then I'll finish. Number one, neonatal abstinence syndrome. We aren't doing enough in, a, in, in that area because there's evidence out there. If, if a hospital simply has a standardized policy for how they're going to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome, it doesn't matter which policy you pick. If you actually just have a standardized policy, the research shows that you can, you can cut NICU stays in half. So why doesn't every hospital out there have a standardized NAS policy? And th there's a whole spectrum that we need to, we need to expand our, our thoughts about NAS, not just to the, to the infant with NAS, but how can we prevent NAS? How can we identify the mothers who are at risk? How can we treat NAS better? And then what are the long-term sequelae of folks who have been identified with NAS and then discharged? What's happening to, happening to them four, five, six years down the road? Number two, we need to have a bigger focus on trauma-informed care and adverse childhood experiences. And the judge alluded to this earlier. Other speakers have alluded to this. But there's not enough discussion about the fact that over half of adults have one adverse childhood experience. That, that, a, that a large majority of a large number of adults have up to three adverse childhood experiences, and that puts people at risk for all sorts of negative sequelae, including addiction. But what's more important is we know what works to actually help mitigate adverse childhood experiences. I, I call on all of you all to help me help me educate the public about what adverse childhood experiences are and what folks can do to mitigate them. And that's where you can bring in the community. One adult, one caring adult in a child's life can make a huge difference in terms of mitigating those adverse childhood experiences that we know folks are exposed to. And then finally, I'm hopeful that my big Surgeon General's report that I put out during my tenure is going to be one on health in the economy. And why do I say that? Because 
Quite frankly, if you talk to mayors, if you talk to governors, if you talk to policymakers, it's the business leaders who are dictating a lot of the decision making that's going on. And we know that when businesses invest in community health, everybody profits. We need to collect the data that shows how, how fostering that interaction between business and health leads to not only healthier communities, but also to, to a more productive workplace. Less days missed from work, less absenteeism, less presenteeism, less, less workplace accidents, uh, more, more youth wanting to come to your town, more, more, uh, more of the uh, intelligent and, and exciting folks want to move to your cities because you've got complete streets, because you've got grocery stores, because you've got smoke-free environments, because you've got a town that's not a place where they're worried about their child having to suffer from addiction. And so those are the, the three areas I'd like to focus on very specifically. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions, and I'm honored to be up here with this uh, illustrious panel. And uh, hopefully we can have some good conversation that will spur you all to action. You should never have a talk without challenging folks. I, I challenge you all to take one thing from one of us up here that you can go home and do. And maybe it's from me, maybe it's from Dr. Gottlieb, maybe it's from one of, the, one of the governors, former governors up here, but take one thing home. And again, if we all do that, we can eat that elephant together. If we don't, it's going to take us a long time and we may never get that elephant eaten. Thank you. Excellent.